Welcome to episode eight of the Dan John podcast, brought to you every week by me and my good friend, Brian. We have a question from Randy Randolph. That's a great name, Randy Randolph. It's a Dan Johnish kind of name. Just want you to know, I really like your books and podcasts. Thank you for contributing to the community at large with your knowledge. Well, thank you. It means a lot. It does. It means a lot. I appreciate that. I have a question, though. I've read a lot about your mass workouts and your blog and books. I know you talk a lot of almost completely limiting cardio during mass game. However, how do I get around that when I am tested on my running ability as part of my job? Well, you don't. You don't. You got you to make a decision. If you're a military guy, um, the enemy really doesn't care about your, your armacondas, you know. Um, you have to make a, a very uh, difficult decision um, when you're building mass for a firefighter job, for a police officer job. You, you, you got to think things through. You know, like, you know, I was in those, when I was in junior college, I took those those uh, criminology courses and they used to say there's, you know, there's three things, the badge, the gun, the car. Those, those are the first three things as a police officer. It's not the badge, the guns and the car. So you have to make that decision intelligently. It is very hard to chase two rabbits and expect to catch them both, but I'll continue on. Um, part of my job. I can definitely pass the test, but attempt to get max, and I'm not sure I can do that if I limit cardio. However, if I put in the cardio work, is it impossible for me to gain mass? How do I get around this dichotomy? Hey, do me a favor. When you do, would you call me and tell me how you did it? Because uh, this is the <laughs> – you're talking about the unicorn of, of our world, this idea that you can be the strongest man in the world, the most cut man in the world – and the best at cardiovascular work. Uh, this is unicorn training. And I know there are people who promise that you can do it all. The problem is at, at very crappy le layers you can, uh, levels you can, I'm sorry. You can, you know, I remember when CrossFit first came out and it talked about, you know, we could take a world-class 800 meter runner and turn him into something else. Well, why would you want, if you're a world-class 800 meter runner, you know, there is no pull-up test at the, you know, at the Olympic games. You know, you, it's really hard to be elite in more than one thing. Man, it's, it's, I mean, it's tar hard to be a, it's hard to be an academic and an athlete at the same time. And so you're asking to, to chase two rabbits. That's going to be tough. Um, are there people who have done it? Um, some, usually sprinters. Sprinters are pretty good about combining the two. You know, you look at to, maybe up to high as the 400 meter guys. You'll notice that they're, you know, they're, they're, they look, you know, like they've spent some time in the weight room, but after that, it gets real dicey. Um, it's a tough one. I, I, I'm, I'm being honest with you, uh, without, without, uh, PEDs, I just don't think it's possible. I mean, that's a horrible thing to say. And it's not, it's not a cop out. It's, it's the coming. It's the truth. Okay. I'm doing my best to be honest with you. Um, I would like to know what the test you're doing is so maybe we could work specifically. So maybe we could work some, some roundabouts, some, some ways of getting around some of it, but uh, maybe that's for another time. Randy, I want you to email back in and, and just tell me what the specific test is. Thank you. My name is Jeff Brahms. I'm 34 married with three kids. Oh boy. I tell you, I have a daughter, seven and two boys, five and three. Good. Don't do anything else. Good. You're okay. Oh, sorry. Let's go on. I've dabbled in Olympic lifting and Highland games for about 10 years. I discovered your train about three years ago and really enjoy it. Early this year, my wife wanted to make a drastic life change. So she asked me if I would write a training program for her. Well, I've heard a lot of brave things in my life, but coaching your own wife might be the bravest thing I've ever heard. Okay, with you in mind, I went and bought some kettlebells. Good. I applied your wisdom, push, pull, squat, hinge, and carry. She's making leaps and bounds, and I wanted to brag on her a bit. Well, this is a great post. This is wonderful. My, my kids see the workout we put her in the house and really want to be part of it, even our three-year-old Hank, big Hank. Uh, that's, that's just wonderful. Um, 
so my daughters grew up, I'm sorry, there's more, there's a question, but my daughters grew up in a home with um, Olympians, special forces guys, um, elite athletes, people working out all the time. And both of my daughters, uh, that is just a normal part of their life at, in their late 20s is, is working out, training, uh, good nutrition, uh, balanced lifestyle. You are giving a gift, Jeff, to your children that you, you, you can't buy. It is a, it is a, it is such a gift and good for you. So I had the, so I had them start doing some very low weight farmer carries and lots of running, jumping movements. Ha, I love it. More like play type movements. I don't use weights to save their joints. Any advice for future workouts for our sons? Well, uh, uh, take them to the, uh, take them to the park and have them play on the monkey bars. Uh, get them hanging and swinging and uh, monkey barn. Uh, it's called brachiating, you know, brachiating, you know, uh, and uh, have them do a whole bunch of vertical stuff. Have, get them up there, uh, get them to pull up and hang and uh, get them to muscle up over the bars as best they can and have a good time. Um, got a friend who's a major league baseball player and he tells me that um, two things separate him from everybody else, his background in gymnastics and his background in BMX racing. Um, the, any gymnastics thing you can get them to do any bike riding, you can get them to do any swimming you can get them to do that. That's where you want to be. Um, and play games, you know, there's a wonderful game called tag, which might be one of the most ancient games we humans have. Um, it is a hunting game. It's a, it's an escape game. It's, uh, I mean, it's basic, uh, uh situational survival 101. So enjoy. I'm very proud of you, Jeff. That's great. That's great to read. Um, uh, my friend Benny uh, Sleisinger write, writes in. Thank you so much for all the info. Love the pod. Sorry, love the podcast and all your writings. I had a question about conditioning with Easy Strength. I love that I'm getting stronger consistently over time, and would love to know your thoughts on improving conditioning at the same time. I don't want to overreach with extra work and compromise strength gains you know, and, and being counterproductive. Oh, yeah. So the idea behind easy strength is that the weight workout takes 15 minutes. And the rest of the time you go do the, well, for example, the Highland Gamer. Um, when I was doing as a discus throw Highland Gamer, my workouts were 15 minutes. And then I would do the throwing drills. I would do the farmer walks. I would do all that other stuff. So what easy strength is trying to do is simply work on one quality, strength, get stronger. All the other time and effort you have is the field of play stuff. Uh, you said conditioning. I don't know what that means in your case, but if you did easy strength and then went on a cross country ski, uh, 10K, uh, you would, uh, you would be getting all the work in that you need. Uh, so Whatever you mean by conditioning, and if it's just general, I mean, I would suggest rollerblading, cross-country skiing, swimming, bicycle, uh, have a real mix of conditioning, uh, walk, uh, walking, rucking, uh, taking, putting weights in your hands and doing Leonard Schwartz's uh, heavy hands, have a real mix of conditioning tools. Um, I was lucky when I was doing easy strength because someone had reminded me of the book Heavy Hands. And I, when I was doing the one winter, especially, I was doing about a, well, the weight workouts didn't even take me 15 minutes. I mean, five exercises for two sets, I could knock it down in 10. But uh, then I would go do a heavy hand walk with these three pound dumbbells I had in just one loop. So that would be about uh, around our old park there. Let's just say a mile. So I don't know how long that mile would take, but I would be done with a strength workout and a kind of conditioning workout in about half an hour, basically the amount of time it would take for the slow cooker to get to the right temperature to add the next round of things. So I was making dinner while I was getting the workouts in. To me, that's the key. Um, again, when someone says something like this, uh, uh, the word conditioning in one of the questions, it's always going to be hard for me to understand. Uh, it's like the old joke we say about 
you know, since I'm in religious studies, when I'm at parties, people ask me a lot about diets and exercise, sure. But I'll get that whole, um, I'm very spiritual question. And I've learned, you have to have that follow up. What do you mean by that? Um, because it usually doesn't mean I just, you know, I want to spend 42 years, you know, meditating on a mountaintop. Usually it's, I check my horoscope every day, which isn't necessarily, necessarily a high level of spirituality. Um, so when someone says conditioning, uh, I always have to hear, what do you mean by it? Uh, honestly, if you're in your sixties, uh, you do the 15 minute easy strength workout and then you, you put in a, a book on tape of a book that you've never heard before and you walk for three chapters that to me and what, and as you're walking down the street, you know, step on and off the curbs, do some, anytime there's a straight line, try to walk on it. Uh, maybe every, catch a ball in one hand or two hands and, you know, give yourself a lot of sensory uh, stuff. Um, that would be great conditioning post 60 years of age. But in your case, you might be getting ready for, you know, the, the Ironman, the double triathlon, you know, double, you know, we run 52 miles. I just need to know what you mean by condition. I thought that was an excellent question. Okay. Uh, this is from Guy Lockheed. I know a place you could work. I am enjoying the podcast so much. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you for, for it and all, you, all, all your other inspira- inspiring work. Um, I wanted to ask your opinion about what makes a great place for training. It's something we discussed at breakfast. I am fascinated by the gym environment and how different spaces make us feel in and about our bodies. Boy, you nailed it right there, didn't you? I would love to hear your thoughts about some of the most special places you've trained in and whether there are any common features, yes, tangible and intangible between them. Many thanks, Guy. Well, I got to tell you, Guy or or Guy, uh, that's a, that's a solid, that's a solid question because you're right. There are tangible things and there are the intangibles. Um, I currently have my own gym here at the home. I have a full membership at Epic and I also have another membership at one of those 24 seven places that has been comped me and I literally never use because I feel that it's such an unwelcoming place. I mean, I feel for people who don't know what they're doing there. God, I'm, I mean, I've been in the weight room since 1965. I know how to do everything, and I just find the place a zoo atmosphere. At my home gym, we f- we strive for something called intentional community. So I expect you to know everybody's names. I expect you to say hi. I really expect you to go out to breakfast with us after. If you're working on something or something happened to you, you got injured, you're, you're, in one case your dad died, and, well, in my case, my brother died, you know. Um, I expect the community to to rally up, um, fundraise if we have to, be friends if we have to. So I'd hate to call that intangible because to me, intentional community is something I can, well, I say I can put my hand on it, but it'll literally in a way, huh? Pat on the back, uh, arm around, a uh, place to cry if you need to. Uh, when the uh, I always tell the story, and in fact, it was his birthday just two days ago. Dick Notmeyer turned 88, and he and his wife celebrated their 70th wedding anniversary. You know, as much as Dick did for me in the area of the snatch, clean and jerk, front squat, mass building, and all that stuff. Um, you know, one of my favorite stories is, you know, I got my dog, Paint the Wonder Dog, when I was in first grade. When I came home from Utah State, uh, it was real obvious. I was a junior in college. I, it was time for him to be put to sleep. He was, he was done. And so I did it. And when I went to the gym, <laughs> here, look at this. <laughs> you know, I was pretty, I was, I was upset, visibly upset. And Dick goes, what's wrong? And I go, you know, I had to put paint to sleep. And what he did was he sat down on the bench and he just started talking about his dog, Reg, and what, how hard it was for Reg, for him when Reg had to be put to sleep. So my training partner, Eric shows up a few minutes later and looks in and goes, what the hell happened here? And Dick goes, and he goes, he, he could barely say it. it was like faint. And Eric flops on another bench. And the three of us just sat there for probably 45 minutes talking about our dogs. That's one of the most important training sessions in my life. You notice I didn't mention snatch, clean and jerk or front squat. 
But to me, uh, that's why I call Dick Notmeyer once a month. And Dick gives me advice that I should sleep well and eat my protein and drink water and don't be stupid. And, you know, because we are a community in that gym where I'm at at Epic, you know, I'll go in like yesterday when I walked in, it wasn't the, the, the gym trainers all said hi to me. Hi, Dan. Hi. But Vicky, who trains about the same time as me every day, she said, hi, Dan, and asked how my weekend was. And we talked for a few minutes. And then, you know, Frankie was over there and we talked for a few minutes. And this, if, so that's what I'm looking for in, in a gym. I'm looking for a place that isn't just supporting me with my furious, tra terrifying trapezius and my blitzered biceps and my tyrannical triceps. I'm running out of words. My pulverizing pectorals and my cannonball deltoids. I want a place that, you know, I want to come back in. Even if it's a bad day, I want to come back in and hang out and, you know, uh, breathe the good air with the, the people around me. So I've noticed that if a very simple one to pick on uh, as we go through this guy is a very simple one is noise. If you come in and it's just ridiculously loud in the gym, that to me is almost universally a turnoff. Um, because, yeah, maybe you can hear hardcore or whatever. That's great. It is hard to be hardcore a long time. Um, you, you watch, you go to hardcore gyms. A uh, friend of mine o o opened one a couple of years back. He told me the biggest dis business mess of his life, um, just constantly breaking things, all kinds of issues, all kinds of fights, not a place he wanted to be in. I like a place that has a business-like atmosphere in the workouts. Uh, people are training. I like to see people on the floor. I like to see people moving things like prowlers or sleds or uh, battling ropes or whatever. I don't care what it is. I like to see things moving. I don't like to see a ton of machines. That's my. That's what I'm looking for. Um, you'll notice if you ever come to my home gym, that's what it looks like. Uh, Epic Fitness there in 33rd, that's what it looks like. So yeah, it, it is interesting because you said tangible and intangible and almost... I did give you some ideas about equipment. Less equipment, to, uh, less machines tends to be better. But I mean, I'm sure I'll come up with a graph for this next time. I'll have this, you know, sweeping graph for you. But less machines, uh, more medicine balls. Less machines, more kettlebells. Less machines, more people getting up and down off the floor. Um, I like I like seeing people doing hip thrusts, and I like to see people doing goblet squats and farmer walks. But the intangible tangibles are things like intentional community, people who care for you, people who you know your name. Um, I don't I don't necessarily – we used to talk about that the worst model of a church is a room full of mirrors. Um, we have a, friends of mine down – go to a Catholic church down this way. And uh, I mean literally every single person in the congregation uh, is white. They all look alike, dress alike. They cheer for the same team. It is the worst model of church I can imagine. Of course, I live in Utah, so that's a lot of that's going to happen no matter where you go. But, you know, to me, the best model of church is that when I see people of various hues and shades and income levels and outcome levels and family dynamics, to me, that's what a church is. To me, a good gym, uh, I look around and if everybody looks like me, I don't want to be at that gym. I want to see a, I want to see people who challenge me uh, and people I can help. But that's... That's my worldview. Um, you know, I don't I don't like rooms full of mirrors. I like I like I like diversity in the people the people I train with. I I don't know if I would learn a lot from a fellow sixty two year old Highland gamer and discus throw. I don't know if I'd learn a lot from another Danny John, but I learn a lot from my trainer who's twenty two and my training partner who's a nurse and she's fifty six. You know, I learn a lot from those guys. Uh, they're amazed at the loads I can put up over my head, and I'm amazed at the, their life story and the fact that they're still showing up. That's what I'm looking for in a gym. Okay, this question comes from Dave Van Vickle. That's a great name. I have a friend named Dave Bickle. Maybe you guys know each other. I'm 36 years old, and I'm a big guy. I usually hover around 300 pounds. Let's keep – I want next time I want to hear 
I'm always under 300 pounds. Remember, 300 pounds is that line in the sand with health. We don't know why, but statistically, you want to be under 300. I absolutely love strongman training, kettlebell training, and really any kind of carry training. Eh, good. I'll do that. I have two children with disabilities. My son, Max, is nine years old and getting heavier for both my wife and I. He is also very awkward to carry and handle. He is hypertonic, so imagine an 80-pound python. Okay, all right, I will. The physical toll of his care is starting to wear on me, and it must be 10 times worse for my 124-pound wife. But more than that, I don't want my physical shape to limit his life at all. For example, a trip to the zoo is crippling, with me picking him up to get good views and all, and I admit there are times I just can't pick him up again. I was wondering what kind of training or program you'd recommend for me and even my wife. I have kettlebells and plenty of free weights. I have a sled and a 330-pound tire I like to use. That being said, I can also earn most of my income from speaking, so I travel a lot and use resistant bands while I'm away, which I do the same thing. Uh, Dave, I, I used the glute loop uh, from Brett Contreras, the mini band, and then I just do push-ups. I should also say that most of my training in the last nine years has not been all that fruitful for my care of Max. Any help you could offer at all would be greatly appreciated. Well, you, I mean, literally, you have an armful. So um, the best piece of advice I can give you right now, uh, I don't think I got your age here, but I'm going to ask you, uh, yes, you did, 36. We, well, let's, let's work on getting your body weight down. Uh, I know you're a strong man. You like that kind of training, but um, I, I would say it would, I wouldn't mind you having some uh, uh, nutritional intervention. I'm not saying you're fat at all. I'm talking about the size. The, like, for example, when I work with guys who just got out of the NFL or just got out of Division I football, they might be 8% body fat, but their size is too much. Um, you know, you, you, it might help for you to, to get some nutritional intervention. I mean, I'm a big fan of the fast mimicking diet. Uh, we have resources on Dan John workouts for that. Um, it doesn't have to be insane. It doesn't have to be bad at all. It could be, there could be like my friend Erica says, you need to X, you need to X one food. <laughs> she X'd wine and had some of the best uh, results of her life. So, uh, as for you guys, um, boy, you already have your, uh, your, 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 your do, do it yourself slosh pipe. But, uh, if you go online and type in slosh pipe, Dan, John, there's an article or two that I explain how to make this. It might be good for your wife. It is basically just a heavy PVC pipe, two thirds filled with water that moves back and forth. But really I'm. I'm concerned about your size dealing with him and the stress of dealing with him. So that'd be number one. Number two, uh, I think you're probably already doing enough in the weight room. Uh, it's going to be your work capacity that we need to work on somehow. Um, so that would, I hate to add more to what you're going through, but this would be the farmer walks. This would be the um, bear hug carries. Uh, this would be all that kind of thing. But this is a tough one, Dave. I, I, I feel like you have a very serious question and a very serious issue, and all I'm offering is uh, toppings. I, I'm, I'm not really giving you much substance, but it's the best I can do uh, given the information I have. In a lot of my workshops, I talk about the most dangerous thing on the gym for me is the floor. And Brian and I were doing the podcast and I had a neighbor come over, knock on the door and say that his wife had fallen and, and he needed help. And it just uh, reminds me of the importance. Uh, everything's okay. Uh, we're all, everyone's going to be fine. But the importance uh, when working with just about every client of not only getting up and down off the ground, but actually practicing in some cases, break falling you know, what are you going to do if you do slip? Um, you know, there's a decision matrix that we do in life where we let ourselves maybe put on a few pounds and maybe we don't get up and down as often as we can. And 
Um, I like to refer to this as toilet bowling, where you you make a series of decisions and then that impacts your waistline, which impacts how you like to walk, which impacts, and pretty soon that impact is hitting your, um, it's hitting your hormonal level. And we tend to, I call it toilet bowling, where all these things just keep accumulating and getting worse and worse. Um, very often it leads, uh, you know, to something as simple as a small avoidable slip or fall. Um, you do damage to a joint and statistically at my age, it's better to get cancer than it is to fall and break a joint, uh, for longevity purposes. Um, so as a reminder to all of you who, who listen to my podcast, uh, you know, practice standing on one foot, um, maybe brush your teeth with your off hand and stand on, on your foot while you're brushing your teeth, uh, floss with your stand on one foot, do the dishes, stand on one foot. When you're going for a walk, you know, practice some balance tests. Uh, keep an eye around your house for places you can slip and fall. Um, it, it happens quickly. Uh, age catches up to us before you know it, but there's things we can do to do like Rob Wolf told me, live long, drop dead. Uh, and one of the things I, I would caution, especially young uh, personal trainers, um, don't be putting people in machines. You know, the best machine in the gym is on the floor. Just get up and get down off the floor a few times. That's a great workout. Do hip thrusts, get up, do push ups. get up, do something else on the ground get up, just keep getting back up. And I think that's the secret to, uh, so much in life. I uh, really appreciate, uh, these talks I have with Brian. I wasn't really expecting in the middle of one of our discussions to have a neighborhood emergency that allowed me to not only help, which I'm very happy to have done, very proud of that, but to be able to use that lesson and share it with you today. So thanks so much.